Thank you, Lord. Oh, praise God. Thank you, Lord. God is good, isn't he? All the time. Ever, forever faithful, full of mercy. Thank you, Lord. He's here for us today, isn't he? Amen. Take, take our heavy burden, our heavy yoke, whatever we call it. He's here, available for you to pass it on to him. And we just pray, Lord, that you will just, just bless us, Lord, with your presence this morning. Just come, Lord, as we worship you in, in spirit and in truth. As we stand now, will we stand? Stand and give him all the glory. Hallelujah. Give him the glory for your life, and for our families, for, for, for our church. On everything he's given us, he's kept us safe this far. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to hand over to Patience now. Thank you, Patience. Thanks, John. Thank you. Amen. Are you ready to worship Jesus? Yeah? Yeah. It's all right to get excited, yeah? Oh, 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 oh,
strength. Amen. And it's just your strength. Hallelujah. So you can express that in your worship to God. Amen. Have a good time in his presence. Yeah. Don't let the devil rob you from the joy of the Lord. No matter what you're going through. Amen. You can express that in worship. Hallelujah. You're rich in love. Ha. And you're still to love. Your name is great. And your heart is kind. Oh, your goodness. I will keep on singing. Let God the reason for my life to cry. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. We love you, Lord. Worship is home.
Worthy, worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord, of glory and honor. Oh, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. It's, it's not about us. Everything is about you, what you have done for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, patience. Thank you, team. Thank you. Whoa. So, can we stand and give a big welcome to our speaker today, Pastor Andy? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you. Amen. Praise God. And it's great to rejoice in the presence of God, isn't it? Just to enjoy his presence. And Praise God. Father, we just thank you today, Lord. We thank you for being in this place. We thank you for what you're doing in our midst. Lord, what you have done in the past, what you're doing, and even what you're going to do in the future, Lord. The good things that you have in store for us. Uh, that good work that you have begun in us, Lord. That, yeah, you are the faithful one to complete it. So we thank you that you are at work within us and within our midst, Lord, to will and to do for your good pleasure. And we just welcome you, Holy Spirit. We thank you that you're here amongst us. 
I thank you that your presence is here. I thank you for every life and every family represented here this morning. That, Lord, as your goodness and mercy will, will catch up on them today, Lord, and bless them and encourage them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So just a little, we talked last week about um, uh, just an affirmation of who we are in Christ and who, and who we are now. <clears throat> how, how God saw fit to affirm his son Jesus just before his ministry. Just before he was led into the wilderness, the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And how God wants to affirm us just as his children, aside from our works, aside from stuff we do in the Christian walk, uh, he just wants to affirm us and give us, make us secure in that identity. As many as received him, to them he gave the privilege to be called the children of God. And God wants to come sometimes and just embrace us and just say, you're my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. So we talked about that and how that brings us into a real place of security and a place of rest. And um, so today, I just want to talk on the first aspect on that sheet that we handed out last week, the heart of an orphan versus the heart of a son. And there's 20 different traits between the orphan spirit, which is a spirit, and a, a kind of traits and feelings and tendencies that you don't belong, and you don't fit in anywhere, and you, you don't really, you're not secure in your identity. And there's a whole list of 20 things there, the heart of an orphan versus the heart of a son. But I'm just going to start on the first one, and, uh, which is the image of God. Seeing God as your master, opposed to seeing God as a loving father. Seeing God as a loving father. And um, our image of God is probably the most important aspect of our Christian walk. I believe that. Your image of God. How you view God. And what your revelation of God is. Because we, we all have different ideas about different situations. But it's so important that we come into, and we grow, and it's progressive, that we grow into revelation of what our God is like. And have a clear image, and be secure in that identity. Because it will, it will affect us, it will affect us. How we see him will, af will affect how we relate to him. How we relate to others. We carry him to one another. And it will also affect the message we carry to the world. How we view God. It's so important to how we view it because the message we carry then will be, will, will be conveyed through us. My dad just came back. I was in London as well. And my dad, my dad went up around the city of London with my two sisters. And he came across a preacher on the street. And he conve my dad conveyed to me, he was angry. He was shouting at the people. I couldn't say that, and I couldn't judge him. I thought, yeah, I could imagine. I, I see him all right in London at, at times. And you'd wonder, is it off putting? He's at the side of the street in Oxford Circus and shouting. Now, I don't know, I don't want to judge, but maybe, you know, if my dad came back and says he was angry with the people, is God angry with the people? No, God is trying to convey his love. So maybe, so so important of how we see God, it is what we will convey. And, um, so we want to look at that this morning, just our image of Just by the way of <laughs> introduction, there's many names for God in the Bible. And down through scriptures, we, we, we see God revealing himself with different names. Uh, someone said there's actually over a thousand names in the Bible that God is called. And some of the most common ones is, you might have come across Elohim. Uh, El Shaddai, we see the name Jehovah. Probably one of the most uh, the most common ones is Yahweh, and uh, it's mentioned in the Old Testament over six thousand times. It's nearly in every book of the Old Testament, and uh, the name a name in biblical times and in God's heart. It's not just a name; it carries meaning, and it carries character. It carries, it carries um, the nature 
of the person. When God was revealed as El Shaddai, that was, he is the almighty one. So he was revealing through his name what he was like. We see Abraham, Abraham getting, his change name to, getting his name changed to Abraham because he was becoming the father of many nations. You know, God changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter. He shall be called Cephas, which is Peter, which means a rock. So names in the scriptures carry meanings. And the great name, the name above all names, is Jesus, which means savior or deliverer. This is what that name means. So, the, so in God's heart, names carry great meanings. And God has revealed himself by different types of names down through the history. And we see then, at the end of Jesus' ministry, just before he was betrayed, in John chapter 17, he was praying to his father. And he said in John 17, verse 6, I have manifested or revealed your name to the men that you have given me. Okay? So all the names of God down to the history. And then he said, then he said to his father, he was praying, I've manifested your name. What did he mean by that? There's no record of Jesus sitting down in scripture saying uh, to his disciples, now from now on, you are to call God Yahweh. And this is the name you're to refer. So what was he meaning by that? There's nowhere in the New Testament that you can see that. Apart from the Our Father, he says, when you pray, say, Our Father. Okay. So what did he actually mean? Um, and I believe what he really meant. In the light of names carry nature and character and purpose. What he was saying was, I have revealed to them what you're like. I have shown them your nature. So there was a progressive revelation. I mean, God is almighty. He's outside time. So from Genesis all the way down, he's bringing a revelation of himself onto the earth. All the way down, he's bringing different revelations of who he is, the great I am. So all the way down, he's bringing these progressive revelations of what he's really like. So at the end of his ministry, he said, Father, I've done it. I've done what you told me to do. I have revealed to them what you're like. And in verse, in verse 26 of that chapter, he said, the world has not known you. The world don't know you. But I have known you. And I have declared to them your name. And he goes on to say, and will declare it. Okay? Jesus is still in his ministry of revealing to us what the Father was like. He said, I've declared to them your name. And I will continually declare it. It's not just a once-off event that I've said to them, you shall call him Abba. You shall call him Yahweh. So... What did he manifest to his disciples? What name or what nature was he showing his disciples what God is like? If you can think of it as a progressive unveiling of the amazing character of our creator. We see Jesus in Mark 4, 14, 36 referring to God in the garden as Abba. He referred to God as daddy. He referred to God as his father. Um, as I said, the Our Father prayer, he instructed his disciples, when you pray, first thing, call him father. Call him father. Um, in Matthew 6, in the, in the portion of scriptures where he's talking about do not worry, you know, do not, the, it says uh, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your, your, he said to his disciples, yet your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. So he's bringing this revelation to his disciples as God, now as a father figure. 
This is the nature that this was the time in history, not that it was absent in the Old Testament. There was elements of that coming through in the Testament, but this was the time that God was unveiling to creation the aspect of him being a heavenly father and that we could actually come into a place uh, and knowing him as Jesus knows him as Abba, Father. Uh, and in verse 26, it tells us why he's done that. It says, the reason he says, I've declared to them your name and will declare it that or so that so I've showed them what you're like, Father. And I'll continue to do it. So that, here you are, you ready? So that the love with which you love me with them. Will we, will we, will we give it another minute? <laughs> We're merciful. We're merciful. Or long, I think it's gone, is it? Um, so the purpose of Jesus revealing to us what the Father was like was the number one purpose that we would know the love that the Father has towards Jesus. And we would be invited into this amazing relationship that was taking place within the Trinity. The love which you love me with may be in them and I in them. So can you see this? This is, this is what Jesus was revealing. This was the number one purpose uh, the nature and the character of his Father. He was displaying it through his life. John, in um, John 13, 1, it says, you know, he loved his disciples and he loved them to the end. It would have been fantastic being around Jesus, wouldn't it? Imagine sitting around with him for three and a half years and with his purpose, the purpose of him revealing his father to us. Hebrews tells us he was the exact representation of of the invisible God. He was the image of the invisible God. He revealed exactly. So this revelation of Father's love was what he was imparting and revealing to his disciples. And I, I really believe this is revelation that he's still doing. Because he says, I, I have done it, Father, and I'll continue to do it. Thank God. Amen. He was doing it this morning. I'm sure there's testimonies of people being touched by God's love. I'm getting the revelation of God just close to them. God embracing them. You know, we sing that song, You're a good, good father. It's who you are. Anyone like that song? Yes. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. And I wonder if you were to cut us open belief system was to be laid out on the table would we really 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 believe that we might agree with the theology of it but in our experience are we is it is it what we've experienced of God because God wants to theology is good and he wants to give us the theology of it but he also wants us to experience it yeah. amen he doesn't just want, want us to know it up here yeah, I know, for God so loved the world. I know that. He wants us to actually experience it. He wants us to know by experience the love that he has for us. And um, this comes by revelation. This can only come by Jesus revealing to you and to I what God the Father is like. And this is part of the plan of God in these days, meaning these days, past 50 years, <laughs> you know, days in God's, what does it say, days a thousand years, you know, in these days, God is revealing 
the very nature of God. And he's still revealing it. Um, Matthew eleven twenty seven said, No one knows the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal. So this is Jesus' ministry. He's revealing who? The Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal. God, you cannot find God. He's not a discovery. He's a revelation. He can only come by revelation. He can only come when God chooses to reveal. And, um, you know, I really think there's many Christians saved. Belong to God. Going to heaven. But they don't see God as a loving father. They don't see him as this. They, see, they might see him as, you know, the one that saved them and forgave their sin. And uh, they see him in some other lens or through some lens of maybe an earthly father. And maybe if the earthly father was strict and the earthly father was, or maybe an, an earthly authority figure that was harsh and hard on them. Could be a dad, it could be a mum. And somehow or another in their subconscious or their consciousness, they're viewing God through them lens. They're viewing God like that. In some way, to see God as this harsh God. And it's so important that we come to the place and we allow God to bring that revelation to us of the Father. I remember one time I was, um, I was getting some ministry, getting some Zozo ministry. And the ministry is really, the big emphasis of it is kind of getting you in connecting with God and getting you in connecting with the love of God. And I can't remember the details of what came up, but it was something about God being a bit distant. And it came up anyway in the time of ministry. I mean, I had a good early father. I still have. He's nearly 80. And he used to work in the brewery next door. But I think he worked an hour overtime in the morning. And I think he worked an hour overtime in the evening. So he would be pretty tired. In them days, at lunchtime, he came home for your lunch, you know, one o'clock or that. And I can remember in, the, in our little sitting room and whatever neighbors would be on telly and he'd be after having his quick lunch. And then he had the snooze. And my image in some way had affected me. In my view of God, I was in some way thinking that God was was, 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 um, I had to in somehow wake him up to get his attention. So it can be, it can be, it can be lots of different types of experiences in life. Maybe hard employers or maybe, you know, just bad parenting, maybe broken families, maybe you didn't have a dad. It can be hard then and all these things can, can in somehow mar and give us the wrong image of what our God is like. And this is why Jesus comes and part of his ministry is revealing to us the very nature of God, that he's a loving father. And when we get this revelation, and it's progressive, when we get this, it does so much in our lives. It brings so much healing in our lives. And um, it's amazing. It's fantastic, you know, when we get that. Um, I'm just going to look at a scripture, Romans 8, 15. I think we touched on it last week. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We don't have to fear. This is fear in the wrong way. There's a reverence of God, but you don't have to fe- We have not received the spirit of slavery. This is referring back to the law and the fear that the law brought. The fear of failure, the fear of breaking the commands of God. But now in Christ, we have not received the spirit of slavery or bondage again to fear or to fear God's judgment. Amen. Jesus took our judgment. Amen. You believe that? He is the propitiation for our sins. He took the sacrifice. So we have not received the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but we've received the spirit of adoption. We've been brought into the family we talked on last week. We've been brought into God's family whereby we can cry out, Abba, Father. Amen. 
we can call out, Abba, Father. And we come in to join Jesus in the relationship with his Father. In Galatians it talks about, um, we've received the spirit of sonship by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So the, the Holy Spirit that's come into our heart gives us that ability. We can only call out Abba, Father when we know him as Abba, Father. We can only cry, Abba, Father, when you know him as Abba, Father. But one of the purposes, you know, Jesus' ministry continued now with the Holy Spirit. Amen. You believe all, you know, he ascended into heaven and not leave your orphans. I will come to you by the power of the Holy Spirit and continue his ministry. So he's continuing his ministry in our hearts now and bringing us to a place where we will know him as Abba. And we will know him as Daddy. And we will know God, the Almighty One, as the one who is our heavenly Father. This is amazing. This is real foundation. Has to be. Because if we get this wrong, if we get this aspect of our Christianity wrong, as I said at the start, it spills over into different areas. So we cry out, Abba, Father. And I really believe God is doing that in these days. And I don't know, it was about 30 years ago, there was a move of God that came, it was started around Toronto. And one of the big emphasis of, the, of that move of God, whether you agree with it or not, you know, or the, agree with the manifestation. Some people struggle with the different manifestations in it. But I was, I experienced it and I was in the midst of churches and ministries and conferences that embraced it and I was really impacted. But one of the big emphasis I can remember was just, I remember this pastor having, it was, he was burnt out and he was just about to give up his ministry. I think it was in Israel and he'd, he'd gone and um, he was giving a testimony and it was just like the sense of God taking him and putting him on his lap and just loving on him. It was the, and the, one of the major parts of the revelation was just the Father revealing his love. God the Father revealing his love to us. And we need that. We need that over and over and over again. It's not just a once-off. Oh, I received the love of God in 1986, and I felt God's love in my heart, and now I journey on. It's a place that we have to enter into, and I believe remain in, in relating to God, others, in what we carry to the lost, in our homes and in our families. And in our little fellowship in, in London, I had five years in the fellowship before I came here. And um, there was an amazing move of God in the 90s. I'm only really realizing it now. Uh, there was lots of testimonies of people getting encounters with God, even on the street. People I met in Ireland here saying, yeah, I was saved in King's Cross in 1990. I said, yeah, I was saved in Shepherd's Bush on the streets. We were saved on the streets. So I had my first major, a major encounter with God on the streets with thousands of people around. But this was part of a move of God in the 90s. And it came through, you know, Toronto, and it went on and on and on. It's still going today. And it's the, 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 the major emphasis was the revelation of the Father's love, that he's a good good father. Now there's theology in the midst of it all and there's teaching. And my five years in England, I can really truly say, in coming back to Ireland in 1990, I was saved in or coming back in 95, I was saved in 1990. I can really truly say what I carried out of all that. You could have slipped me open and you could have is all you would have seen is I knew that God was a good, good father. And I knew that God is a God of love. You could not convince me otherwise. I've had people telling me I should be preaching harder on sin. You know, and if you talk on love too much, it means you're not hard on sin. You know, I was, with the revelation of God's love in my life, I was actually harder on sin in myself 
because I had a revelation of his love. I had the love of God, and I said, I don't want to do that. I'm not looking at that. That come on the telly, turn off that. Because I had the love, because I had that revelation, uh, and this was just priceless. This was my jewel. This was what I'm carrying. So this is not a weak message. I said to someone one time, he was a young believer, and I said to him, do a study on God's love. He was nearly offended. <laughs> he said to me a year or two after, he said, do you remember that? I said, yeah, I remember that. But he didn't see it at the time. He was wanting to get into, you know, last days and eschatology and deep things, the deep things in scripture. And I just, I was saying to him, do a, do a study on God's love. And he, a year or two later, he understood it. You know, this is major. And this is, if this is what Jesus came to reveal, this is what Jesus came to reveal to humanity. For God so loved the world. This is what this was the revelation. And we get off in this doctrine and these issues and these things. And these are good, but we've got to keep love at the center. We keep the Father's love, not just in our theology, but I encourage you to seek an experience of this. Because I do believe um, God wants to bring us all into it. Amazing the amount of Christians I meet and they say, uh, you know, they don't experience God's love in their life. And I don't know the answer, but there is an answer. And the answer is Jesus. Because this is what he done. And he's still doing it by the power of his Holy Spirit. It's we have received the Spirit in our hearts. And what does the Spirit bring in Romans 5.5? 5, 5? The love of God. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. This is what he brings. And this is what he brings us into. Do you remember John 14, 1 to 6? Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God and all that. Believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. In my Father's house. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Here's this. Where was he going? And where was he leading people to? The Father. He says, I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the didn't say the mansion. They're up there. But where is he leading us to? The Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I want to say Jesus' ministry in your life is to lead you to the Father and to show us what his Father is really, 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 really like because we get he's been misrepresented through tradition through lies of the enemy and this is what Jesus wants to reveal we ha we both have access it says i think it's Ephesians 2:18 by one spirit we have access through him to the father and this that's that's our journey so embrace it and um, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Amen. The Amplified says, see what incredible quality of love the Father has shown us. Amen. The Father's love is inward, upward, and outward. When it's inward, it fixes us on the inside. It heals our heart. It heals the wounds. It brings security. It brings deliverance. I can say the love of God in my first few years was like a hot iron straightening out an old crinkled shirt and just ironed out my heart and, and brought so much healing. So the love of God is inward. And then when we get straightened out inward... He loves us. We've experienced it 
our worship day and upward becomes pure. It's not just lips. It's not, we're not just following the worship leader and we're singing words. It's really genuine from our heart. Because we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. So it's inward we receive his love. And only then can our worship become pure. We get straightened out inward, our heart. Then it straightens out our worship. It becomes what the Father is seeking. In John 4, he's seeking worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And receiving that love will straighten out that. And then it's outward. It's the message that we carry. Amen. To the broken and to the dying world, they do not need to hear that God's angry with them. <laughs> That's the enemy line to them. You know? Amen. We serve a good, good Father. Amen. The power of his love is amazing. And you know, it's so important we get this. And I, I do believe we, you know, there was, when I lived there in England, there was, it was, there was a revelation of the love of the Father pouring out. And I don't fully understand it in geographically different areas of the earth where there's outpourings and there's revelations. But I do think we have a way to come here in Ireland. Maybe it's because of the traditions. Maybe it's because of the baggage that we carry. But I do think we have a way to come in the area of that revelation of the Father. I love going back to some of these places in England and you just get the sense of nearly like, I don't know if I want to say it, nearly like a bigger open heaven. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate. But you get there and I've gone to lots and lots of conferences and it's nearly like there's a greater revelation in, in the spirit realm of the Father's love. And that's because... I believe the move of the Holy Spirit there. And, you know, God is no respecter of persons. Amen. And I do believe he wants to just pour out that into our lives. It will, it will heal your heart. It will heal your worship. It will give you a press, precious message to carry to the lost. Amen. The Father's love. And this is the ministry of Jesus. Amen. Praise God this morning. Just as we finish, I just want to give, if you're here this morning and um, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe could we all stand to our feet and the worship team come? I just don't want to take it for granted that everybody knows Jesus, that everybody is saved, going to heaven, and names in the Lamb's book of life. And as we said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And I just want to give you an opportunity to receive Christ today into your life. If you haven't done it, maybe with every eye closed. And if you're here and you haven't received Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior, we just want to give you an opportunity. We're going to pray a prayer that will help you open your heart. In John 1, it says, Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right or the privilege to become a child of God. So the way into the kingdom, the way into, the, into Christ is just receiving him and believing on his name. Amen. That Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That we are sinners and we accept him into our life. So with every eye closed, if that's you this morning, I just want you to raise your hand. Just to acknowledge that you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior into your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If I was to ask the question to you, if you were to die today, are you sure you would know where you go? Have you got that confidence in your heart that you're going straight to be with Jesus? And if you haven't, today is the day of salvation. Today is your day to reach out and say, I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus, into my life. Hallelujah. So let's pray that prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you died on the cross. I'm a raised from the dead. I'm a raised from the dead. For me. For me. I confess I'm a sinner. I confess I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me. 
ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Take over my life. Take over my life. And be my savior. And be my savior. And be my Lord. In Jesus name. In Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you've done that for the first time, I want you to go and tell somebody and uh, tell them that I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen. It's a good thing to do. Bless you. Have a great week. I'm going to be praying that the Father's love will be revealed over your life again and again and again. I pray it. I pray it a lot for the church that we be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week. Stories of what they think you're like, but I heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never. Thank you.